Good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you today? Great. I'm excited, too, because today we have a guest on our show who's going to give us a little tour of the Sunset Strip. Now, her tour is going to be unlike any tour we've taken yet, because she was told to move to Los Angeles by Tom Petty, came out to Los Angeles, and ended up managing Motley Crue, Poison, Striper, Faster Pussycat, and Guns N' Roses, amongst being a uh, a and r rep for geffen records capital records and having a heavy hand in helping june carter win a grammy so this is going to be great today you guys are going to meet vicki hamilton and she's going to tell us her story of the sunset strip days of jordan the lion begins now now vicki's actually written a book about her life um, and so if you have the book it's called appetite for dysfunction if you have it or plan on getting it this will basically be a, uh, a visual tour of a lot of the stories she tells. Taking Jaw to the dog park first though. So actually how we got hooked up with this is uh, my good friend Rob has been friends with Vicky, um, you know, since the, the 80s when he had a band that uh, she was helping out. And so he's going to come meet up with us and help go kind of go see some sights with us. And we're really lucky that this was able to happen today because uh, Vicky just had a big article written about her in Forbes magazine that I'll, uh, I'll link to it in the description box below. And so she's been really busy lately. So very cool of her to take the time out to come do this video with me. How are you today? Good boy. Well here's where our tour is going to start today. We're currently standing in front of Oz but it used to be the Music Hall record store in the 70s, and then was later Licorice Pizza. And that's where Vicki Hamilton's gonna start our story today. Licorice Pizza wasn't actually a pizza place. It was also a record store with a crazy story. And here's a photo matching up when it was Licorice Pizza. Well, here we are with Miss Vicki Hamilton. Now, Vicki, tell us how a lovely young woman from Indiana ends up working at Licorice Pizza here. Well, it's not Licorice Pizza anymore, it's Oz now, but um, I got hired by Gary Gersh who um, went to go work at the main office at Licorice Pizza right after he hired me and then I worked with him at Geffen Records down the street and the Capitol Records so I've had a long history with Gary Gersh but when this was uh, Licorice Pizza, this window was where we did the Motley Crue display for Too Fast for Love when they were on Leather's, Leather Records and we had um, mannequin parts holding album jackets and tarot cards and Vince brought me a pair of dirty underwear from some girl from the night before and uh, uh, we had wits and chains and handcuffs the band. They live right up the street on Clark, which I'll show you in a minute. And uh, yeah. You had a great go-go story. Did that happen here? Yeah, that was here as well too. The line, it was for Beauty and the Beat, their uh, debut album. And there was a line all the way up Sunset. And they signed records, no kidding, for at least five hours. And then finally we had to cut it off. And um, there was some guy like knocking on the door there, like for Jane Weedland. And he's like, Jane, Jane. And she came to the door and he goes, let me have your phone number. And she like scribbled her phone number down on a sheet of paper and gave it to him. And she's like, here it is, but I'm not going to be home for a year. And I thought that was so cute. I never saw male groupies before. I was like, I was like, wow, okay, Hollywood. Love now, it. is that how you ended up meeting some of the bands that you would come to manage eventually, like Motley Crue and Poison? Was that um, here? Yes. Uh, well, I met Motley Crue here. It was like Nikki Six and his then girlfriend, who was a fashion model, Evelyn Rock, came in and were like chatting me up. And, um, you know, Nikki and I both love Bowie and um, 
Sweet and some of the other bands on the scene. And uh, now, was that your plan when you came here? Was was that to be a manager, or like how did you yes. start in the record store and then transition? Well, I worked in a record store in Indiana, so I had that on my resume. So that's kind of how I got the job here. And. Um, but I wanted to be a band manager. That was the plan. And who was the first band that you worked with? They were called Dynasty from Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was my boyfriend's band, yeah. And did they and come he out here? here? Yeah, he lives out here now, too. Yeah. We're still friends. And then who was the first L.A. band that you ended up taking on? How did you, you know, uh, get somebody to trust you enough to let you manage them? Well, oddly enough, it was Motley Crue, but I didn't manage them. I was the, a management consultant for Motley Crue. I got hired by their first manager, Alan Kaufman, and I did um, a bunch of display merchandising for them. This window, a bunch of licorice pizza stores all over town, and, um, you know, that kind of led to them getting signed to Electra Records because Tom Zutat saw the display here and then went over to the Whiskey to see them for the show. So. And now you were telling me that Sunset Strip was a much different place then. Could you in any way describe what the scene was like here on the streets up and down Sunset? Well, all the bands came to the Sunset Strip to make it in the 80s and you know at night it would just be from here all the way down to the Rainbow Roxy, people with flyers passing out their shit and you know, it wasn't illegal to put flyers on the pole so they would be like this thick on the pole. It was like crazy. Now let's go up and take a look at the uh, Motley Crue house. The red, white, and blue bow on the door over there. Yeah, straight through. Yeah, that's the Motley Crue apartment. And what time frame were they living here, would you say? Um, that would have been 81. That's where they got kicked out by the Board of Health for throwing trash off of their balcony in the back down on the apartment below. And you said this was too fast for love, but it was the Leather Records version? Yeah, the, the indie version. And they would have been basically probably playing the whiskey a lot probably during that time? Yeah. Or were they like a house band anywhere? Yeah, they played the whiskey and one night I saw them like smacking hands with the people waiting in line as they were like leaving their apartment. That's crazy. And they live now to Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue, did they hang were they friends at this time when or would they would Motley Crue have been yeah, gone from here yeah, at that time? Motley was gone. But I, I lived in this building for a while too. I lived in this apartment right here, but not when Motley lived here. And we used to have parties up on the roof. Now did the whole band live here together at that time? Um, everybody but Mick, who I think lived in Redondo Beach as well. Okay. He was always a little bit older than the other guys, yeah. wasn't he? He didn't hang with them. But, you know, I used to see them when I worked at the record store, walking up the hill in their stilettos, and I'm like, you know, that was during punk rock time, so it was like, what the hell? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so they didn't just wear that for performances. That wasn't just oh, like no, a stage was, show. They were doing that all the time. That was kind of their stick, yeah. Now, who wrote most of the music for them? Did I mean, did anybody bring in, uh, like, demos for you to listen to predominantly, or was it kind of the whole uh, group? You know, Nikki wrote most of everything. He was kind of the mastermind, I think, of Motley Crue. So this is 1114 Clark Street where I live with Guns N' Roses. So don't let anybody take you to the wrong spot. <laughs> now how did that how did that happen, Vicky? Um, how did you end up managing Guns N' Roses? Who one of the questions that everybody asked was, who was it that did you know first? Who was the easiest to deal with in the band and how did you come to I knew Slash because he was in Black Sheep with Willie Bass and I was booking them at Silver Line Entertainment. I was an agent then. And um, Axel called me up on the phone and said, you know, you come highly recommended. We'd like you to like book some gigs for us. And um, <clears throat> he said, can I come over and bring you a, a demo? And I was like, well, I don't have a stereo. He's like, it's okay, I'll bring a ghetto blaster. So like a few hours later, Izzy and Axel show up and play me their demos. And they were so good that I booked them sight unseen with Black Sheep and uh, Striper at the Music Machine. Now, were there any songs on that demo that ended up coming out later that we would all know or that other people would know? Um, Paradise City, Think About You, and uh, 
back off bitch, I believe, yeah. Now, where was the apartment in location to where we are? Can you point that out yeah. for us? If you look straight through the wrought iron, it's that bottom apartment where the chair is, and it looks like there's like a briefcase hanging. See that? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Now, you told me a great story about when Axel first played November Rain for you. Yeah, well, that that was not here. That was on um, Fountain at a photographer's studio where when they shot the cover for Music Connection. But you said that there was something he said to you that I thought was really very Axel. You said he played this beautiful oh, song. Said, and wow, I never thought you, I never knew you could play piano like that. And he lowered his glasses and looked at me and goes, Vicki, there's a lot of things you don't know about me. Now, did they ever write songs in here in that six months that they were kind of all crashing here? Did you ever see um, them jam or was well, this more of... They were always jamming. Whether those ended up being any of the songs, I don't really know. But yeah, they they were always jamming. So. Yeah, because I had heard that uh, Axel said they loved to write acoustically. So a lot of the songs were all written acoustically in people's crash pads or whatever. And uh, it's really interesting. Did you ever worry about letting the band live with you? I mean, you had a roommate. Was there ever well, any was kind of... it was never intentional. It was supposed to be a couple of days. He was supposed to be on the couch, and a couple of days ended up to six months of everybody living with me except for Duff. Yeah. And then you got them, basically you were managing Guns N' Roses when they got Appetite for Destruction, and the day that you guys were supposed to go sign the deal, what happened? <clears throat> um, Axel couldn't find his contact lenses, so he ended up on top of the Whiskey A Go Go over there, uh, looking out over the city. But yeah, we were several hours late to go sign the contract. So this would have been the apartment that they all lived in, and Vicky has a pretty funny story about this pool. We'll get her to tell you real quick. So this is the swimming pool. While when they were making their first backdrop, that they were washing it off into the pool, and the landlord got really pissed off and came out and was like, "What are you doing? Get that backdrop out of the pool!" <laughs> what? Well, you said there was like ink or something. All the ink yeah, was the ink running was off. Coming off into the swimming pool. He and, wasn't happy. And then you said they used to go up to the roof a lot. Yeah. The party place was on the roof because they didn't. They knew that I didn't approve of anything except for smoking pot and a little bit of drinking. So they would go up on the roof and party. So this is the infamous laundry mat where Kim Fally cornered me after he wanted to buy a few of Guns N' Roses' songs from Appetite for Destruction, and I was like, "Not gonna happen." Right here. Inside this laundry room. Yeah, right here. I like slid under his arm and got out of there when he was like going crazy, you know, at me. So right directly in front of us is if you walk right out the door of Vicky's old apartment, that's the Whiskey A Go Go. And you can still see, if you look closely, she was telling me that uh, there used to be a fire ladder that Axel used to climb up the side of that and it's still there. That's how he was able to get on the roof when he couldn't find his contacts. Yeah, I think they like uh, took part of the ladder down because how do you get up there? Now, of course, you can see Vicky next to the plaque and right there, this is the history of the Whiskey A Go Go. Mentions all the greats that performed here, including Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue. Which I saw both of them here and booked. Well, I didn't book Motley Crue there, but I did book Guns N' Roses at the Whiskey several times. And they never played together in those days, did they? No, no, no. I'm not even sure they met until probably Cat House days. Because Molly Crew was on the road all the time. Okay, that's. The, I wanted to establish to people kind of what was going on on the Sunset Strip at that time. You know, it was like Motley Crew, Quiet Riot were kind of the leaders of that. Now, one of the stories that I had mentioned to you was that I'd always heard since I moved out here that Slash auditioned for Poison but he didn't get the job because they didn't like him. Now, that's not exactly true. Do you want to tell yeah, how he ended him. up How he ended up auditioning? You know, it's like they all had a little meeting and, you know, they decided Slash would be the guy. And but how did he audition? Who, who recommended him audition? Um, I think I did. But, um, you know, he, he did the audition and they were all sitting around the table at the rehearsal hall and Brett's like, yeah, we, you know, we want you to be the guitar player and Slash said, okay, well, I'm not going to wear all the fucking makeup and I'm not going to say, hi, my name's Slash. And then like a couple days later, CC entered the picture. Probably for the best. Mad. I was 
there for that audition too. It was like, you know, Cece's real name is Bruce. And they were like trying to come up with like a glam rock name for him. And I said, you know, how about like something like Meet Mercedes? And then the next thing you know, it was Cece DeVille. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Wow, not Guns N' Roses related, but wow, that is awesome. That is greatness. I love that kind of stuff. Well, here we are at the famous Rainbow Bar and Grill. Where most bands came together in this par parking lot, getting together for auditions and things. They're, uh, they're having their anniversary party here today, so can't really take you out onto the parking lot, but at two o'clock when they would close the place down, everybody would like hang out in the parking lot and figure out where their after party was gonna be at. And, um, hang out out here. This patio thing is like a new thing in like the last, I'm gonna say 15 years or something. That wasn't there in the 80s, so that's all new. What brought people here? Do you have any idea why everybody, why this became the it's rock bar? Kind of the rock and roll diner, you know? It's like from nine o'clock on, it was like, you know, Motley Crue hung out here, got some roses. I still see then. Slash here from yeah. time to time. Yeah. Now this is really cool for me because Vicky's showing us this was the former location of Geffen. She said there used to be a big G right up in here. And when I was a kid and I got into Guns N' Roses, I got Appetite for Destruction when I was seven years old. The only thing I knew about the band, I didn't know hardly anything other than their names other than they were on Geffen and I thought all the bands that signed with the record label lived at the record label. So it was a big dream of mine to always come to this building and see where I thought Guns N' Roses lived. If I ever made it here, I could just walk in here and hang out with them. And uh, obviously that probably wasn't the case, but uh, just so cool to get to see this from my, uh, my childhood memories. There was a bidding war for Guns N' Roses. There was like 20 labels interested in them. We took a lot of dinners and um, they ended up signing with Geffen. And um, I took an A&R job at Geffen. And why did you take the A&R job, just out of curiosity? Um, I kind of wanted security, a paycheck, and an expense account. <laughs> now there was a story, and if you don't want to answer, you don't have to, but there's a story that I've always heard that, you know, when the band was going to sign their deal, that Axel wanted somebody to walk, a woman to walk down the street, uh, scantily clad, and if he would, the band would sign with them, but that she was, wouldn't do. That was Susan Collins at Christmas Records, and that was, uh, down around the corner. So there, there is some truth that that yeah. was made as a joke, or yeah, even... it was a joke. She would have never done that, but he did throw that out there. Now, do you think the band made the right decision with Geffen, considering everything yeah. that happened? Do you think that was the right place for them? Yeah, definitely it was the right place for them. And right next to this was, you said, where your office was. The second and third window in, that, that was my office up there. And then you left Geffen, you went and worked at Capitol, and then you worked with a great... No, I, went, I went from Geffen to Lookout Management. Oh, okay. Santa Monica, and then I went to Capitol. And you got to work with June Carter, Cash. I did that on my own. That was on my own. Well, that's what I was going to say, is after you had done all that, you went and helped her win a Grammy. Yeah. How did you get connected with June? Um... I met June at the House of Blues when she played with Johnny Cash. I was managing a band called the Freewheelers that opened for her. And um, I told Rick Rubin how much I loved her performance. And he was like, you should make a record with June. And I was like, yeah, I don't know shit about country music, but thank you. And then the next day, June called me at my office, left me a message. And she's like, I want to meet you for lunch. So I went, I met with her, I fell in love with her. and. Um, we made a little history making the June Carter cash record. Well, you have a great history and you not only have a new article in Forbes, but you also have a great book out. Do you want to talk about the book? Yeah, the book is called Appetite for Dysfunction and it's uh, my memoir about the music business and all the bands I worked with. Um, and a lot of places we saw today are yes. kind of mentioned in the book. Yeah, all of those places were mentioned in the book. And 
I'm in the process of uh, cutting a deal for a fictionalized version of the TV series of the book. So. And, and you actually told me something really cool. You said if uh, anybody that watches this decides that they want the book and they go to your site, that you'll sign it for them. And yes. it costs exactly the same anywhere else as what you charge. Yes. So go to VickiHamilton.com. It's V-I-C-K-Y-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N. Dot com. I still have some of the pre-first editions, which there were only a thousand of those made, and uh, I'll sell those for twenty dollars and sign them. And uh, or you can get a second edition for twenty-five dollars, and I'll sign that. But right now, because of the Forbes thing, I'm out of the second edition. So well, this so I have to wait for a couple of weeks. So. Yeah, this video will be seen for a while in the future, so they'll always be able to hit you up and get one. And, um, and how cool to get it signed by you. We're looking behind the, uh, the curtain here in the driveway and we noticed that there's some broken windows in there. So Geffen is most definitely, the old Geffen building is coming down soon. Well, at least half of it. Yeah. yeah I don't think they're tearing down the other piece. And right here, Vicky says this was McGee Entertainment and they were the manager of Motley Crue. Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi, yeah. Well, we're about to do our last stop on the tour today with Vicky, and where we're headed to now is the practice space of Guns N' Roses. Well, Vicky says this place has changed quite a bit, but what was this, Vicky? This is where the Guns N' Roses rehearsal hall was, where they lived before they lived with me. And uh, they've refaced the whole place, so it's hard to know exactly where it was, but I remember it being about this far down. They had parties in this parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. Hi. And this was like the first space that the, as a band together they would have practiced in? Yes. Wow. That's so cool to see. Well, Vicki, we can't thank you enough for taking us around and getting to show like your Sunset Strip memories. What are you up to now? Do you want to tell people what you're doing now? Yes, I'm uh, starting a record label called Dark Spark Music and um, should be up and running soon. It'll be darksparkmusic.com. I'm doing a pledge campaign to help fund it, um, which will be up soon as well. Uh, we're working on a TV series. I'm still consulting bands. Right now I'm working with Damien Sage, Darby Sean, and a band from Brooklyn, New York called the Tinder Beats. They're very groovy. And uh, yeah, that's it. Still no, very active in music. I love yeah. hearing that. So many people transition into different things, but you're good at something and you know it and you stick with it. I love that. Well, my dreams get bigger, but I still always keep the music going. Now, if people want your book and they want to get it through you, where can they go? They can go to VickiHamilton.com. Cut out that middleman. Buy it from me direct. And get it signed. And get it signed, yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, All Vicky. Right. Okay, thank you. And we decided to come get a bite to eat afterward at a real rock and roll LA establishment toy. Well, here's Rob. Dude, thank you so much for hooking me up with Vicky. And we got her book. And here's Rob with his band inside the book when he was on Geffen Records. Right up there in that corner. That's awesome. And Vicky signed you, right, Rob? Yes. Yes, I love Vicky. She's awesome. She made dreams come true for me. I always love Vicky Hamilton. She's great people. Oh, there's another picture of you. Graveyard train. Well, gang, I'm going to call it a night. I wanted to thank Jeffrey Kidd and Rosalie Allen for making contributions to my channel. And a huge thank you to Vicky Hamilton for taking so much of your day to come out and do this today. I mean, if you believe in the butterfly effect, and you think about everything that Vicky had her hand in with all those bands, that's a pretty important person. And for her to take her time out to show us where all those things happen and tell us her stories, I'm forever grateful. And I bought a book, I bought Rob a book, and I suggest if you like this vlog and you liked hearing those stories, go get her book where there's even more stories about even more bands and more on those bands. And you'll get to hear those stories in that book and see exactly where they took place. Thank you all for watching. Have a great night and goodbye.